For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for the purpose of inquiring With to the majority leader the floor schedule for next week. Without objection. Thank you. And also, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. With that, Mr. Speaker, I would now like to yield to my friend, the Majority Leader, and welcome back the Majority Leader to the colloquy, and uh, good to see you spry. And uh, with that, my friend, the Majority Leader, uh, I yield. I thank the uh, uh, gentleman from Louisiana, uh, Mr. Scalise, for yielding. On Monday, the House will meet at 12 p.m. for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business, with votes postponed until 10.30 p.m. On Tuesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. I want to make that clear. That's an acceleration from 12. We have a lot of business to do next week. Uh, we have a lot of appropriation bills, so we want to make sure that we're not meeting late, late into the night. So on Tuesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and 12 p.m. for legislative business. On Wednesday, the House is expected to meet at 11 a.m. for legislative business. On Thursday, the House will expect to be meet at 10 a.m for legislative business. On Friday, the House will meet, as usual, at 9 a.m. for legislative business. The House will consider several bills under suspension of the rules. The complete list of suspensions will be announced by close of business tomorrow. In addition, the House will consider at least seven of the 12 appropriation uh, bills for fiscal year 2022, uh, recognizing the importance of completing uh, our work at, well in advance of the deadline at the end of September. I would let the members know that, unfortunately, uh, well, first of all, let me say we've marked up all 12 bills and they have been reported out of committee. The Senate has not reported out nor considered a single appropriation bill. And we have 60 days before the end of the fiscal year, approximately, give or take. The House will consider a seven-bill minibus H.R. 4502. Uh, that bill will include seven appropriation bills, the Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Bill, the Agricultural Bill, the Rural Development, uh, and, and Agriculture and Rural Development, Energy and Water Development, Financial Services, and General Government, Interior, uh, Environment, Military Construction, and Veterans Affairs, Transportation and Housing, and Urban Development Appropriations Act. Uh, there will be a, additional uh, bills uh, on the appropriation. There are obviously, uh, after the seven, five additional appropriation bills that will uh, be available for uh, consideration. Three of those bills, as I understand it, have been noticed by the uh, Rules Committee for amendments to be filed. So they will be ready to go next week, and I'm hopeful that we will be able to move uh, some of those bills uh, next week. Uh, they will be uh, uh, the Legislative Branch Appropriation Bill, the Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies Appropriation Bill, and the Department of State and Foreign Operations and Related Programs <coughs> Appropriation Bill. Uh, that will leave uh, the Defense Bill and the Homeland Security Bill. Uh, lastly, additional legislative items are possible. Uh, and that will be our schedule for the uh, week to come. <clears throat> I expect it to be long days, which is why we're going in at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Well, on one day, 10 a.m. On, on two of the days, which we usually go in at 12. <clears throat> I would hope that that would preclude us from going very late at night, but I think everybody ought to expect that we will be here um, into the evening. And I yield. <laughs> Thank the gentleman for yielding as we look towards this appropriations process coming to the floor next week. I would hope it doesn't take the same tone that it took in committee, and that is a hyper-partisan approach, which in years past you've seen Republicans and Democrats come together to, uh, to ultimately determine how best to fund this United States government. And, and any bill that's going to get sent to the president's desk is going to ultimately be a bipartisan bill. Unfortunately, that's not the bill that's going to be coming to the floor. There are a lot of very, very extreme radical elements that were put in that bill, uh, but there was also something very alarming, and that was a, a break, a departure from over 40 years of bipartisan agreement on what is known as the Hyde Amendment. Henry Hyde in the 1970s uh, was able to get agreement between Republicans and Democrats to say on all the things we may disagree with, let's at least agree that taxpayer funding should not be used for abortions. Uh, and 
overwhelming majorities of Republicans and Democrats have supported that. Going back to 1976, uh, this appropriations bill guts the Hyde Amendment and, and why this Democrat majority decided to break from decades of bipartisan agreement on Hyde is perplexing, but I would hope among many other things, we'd be able to have that full debate on the House floor, that amendments like restoring Hyde would be made in order, not a closed process, not a very narrow process where the goal would be to push a hyper-partisan bill out of the House that won't become law, which means it would be a very futile exercise that we'd be participating in next week, but in fact to work in a bipartisan way on those things that we can come to an agreement on about how to properly fund the government. I'm not sure if that's being anticipated with the seven bills that are coming in this bloated bus, but I would hope uh, that the majority, uh, as the Rules Committee uh, looks to determine which amendments would be made in order, would go to an open process and let things like the Hyde Amendment be debated and, and frankly, to be supported uh, in the bipartisan way that it's always enjoyed uh, going back over 40 years. And so uh, maybe the gentleman uh, I thank you, shed gentlemen. light on that, but I would yield on, I thank on that. Thank the gentleman for his comments. Uh, he is certainly accurate that the Hyde Amendment has been in our bills for a very long period of time. Uh, what I think uh, is not completely accurate that it has been a bipartisan uh, support. It has enjoyed bipartisan support in that there were Democrats who obviously supported the Hyde Amendment. Uh, and I realize that uh, this has uh, made it controversial, uh, having been left out uh, of the bill. Uh, I don't know what the Rules Committee is going to do. Uh, we'll have to wait to see uh, what they do. Uh, but any man, I want to tell you that the large uh, number on our side of the aisle uh, believe that a constitutionally protected uh, uh, health care matter uh, for women ought not to be determined by their financial uh, ability. So there is controversy with respect to Hyde. There's also controversy with respect <coughs> to federal employees uh, as well that I know well because I chaired that subcommittee. Uh, we give to federal employees a health care benefit, uh, but then we say they can't use it for uh, some things. Actually, that money is their money. It's not our money. It's given in compensation for their services. But in any event, so there are controversies, I would tell the gentleman. And uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what the Rules Committee is going to do and therefore don't want to speak for it. And gentlemen, yield back. Sure. I yield. I, I appreciate yield it. And hopefully, like I said, we get that opportunity to have that open debate process so that we can bring amendments like restoring Hyde to this floor. Uh, I'd also like to ask about something that is going to be coming up next week, and that is this January 6th commission that the speaker created. Uh, is expected to meet next week. Uh, yesterday, we saw an alarming departure from congressional tradition, and that is Speaker Pelosi unilaterally made a decision to remove minority members from that committee. Uh, you go through the history of Congress, and prior to this year, What's this? never has the Speaker denied the minority the ability to choose who they're going to put on committees. Uh, and not only did it happen yesterday with multiple members, a ranking member of a standing committee was removed, a, an officer in the United States Navy was removed from that committee without explanation. Uh, that, that first of all undermines all credibility that this committee will have. It's clear that now it's an attempt by the Speaker to just completely politicize that committee, why the majority chose to abuse power in that way and deny minority rights in that way is perplexing, uh, but it doesn't bode well for the institution, uh, and it surely doesn't bode well for the impartiality uh, and the credibility of this committee. Uh, I don't know if the majority is looking at reconsidering that decision, uh, but obviously it's unprecedented. And uh, if the gentleman wants to explain that, I'd be happy to yield. Um, well, I think the gentleman can explain it. I think, frankly, uh, uh, your party is hoist on its own petard. We brought to this floor 
uh, with uh, Mr. Katko and uh, Mr. Thompson agreeing on the process, uh, offering to the House an equally divided five and five commission, uh, the five being totally in the, uh, Republicans being totally in the ambit of the minority leader. We brought to, to the floor uh, the subpoena power being equally divided between the parties and having to cooperate in accomplishing uh, the issuance of a subpoena. And very frankly, although there was some discussion of it, there was no doubt uh, that the uh, staff uh, would have been resolved, question of being e equal staff on the Republican and Democratic side would have been resolved in the Senate. I see a gentleman shaking his head. I can tell him I know it would have been resolved, period. And the Republican Party objected to that uh, commission, equally divided five and five, with the minority leader strenuously uh, lobbying against it being passed in the United States Senate. It was not passed in the United States Senate. Uh, press asked me, uh, if it's defeated in the Senate, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to move forward, of course. And that's what we're doing. We're moving forward. Now. Uh, the, the makeup of that committee, uh, three of the uh, persons who were appointed by the, uh, excuse me, were recommended by the minority leader, were accepted by the speaker. Uh, two, and I'm not going to spend a long time going into the quotes of the two or their premises, uh, but all I can say is when asked the question, uh, Ms. Cheney, who I know you folks have kicked out of leadership because she tells the truth, uh, said, and, and I would ask the gentleman I don't know who, to back away. That was not the reason that Ms. Cheney was removed as chair. Well, it had that's, nothing to do that's certainly one with opinion, statements however. that were made. I, that's one opinion. Now, she said. It's an opinion asked, that we don't share because it's not accurate. Well, I, I clearly know we don't share that view, uh, but uh, uh, it was referenced that, well, she may have told the truth, but she ought to stop telling the truth. Well, that was one of the references we made uh, as uh, you replaced her as uh, your third in line, because she, from our perspective, and from, I think, a large perspective of the American people, told the truth. And she continues to tell the truth. And she was asked the question, what do you think about this nonpartisan investigation? She said, I am absolutely confident that we will have a nonpartisan investigation, that it will look at the facts, that it will go wherever the facts may lead. There are three members from the minority leader proposed that the speaker has agreed to, didn't, or did not object to. She's objected to two members. And the rhetoric around this from minority uh, leader and from those two members has been disgraceful. Thus, uh, this must be an investigation that's focused on facts, and the idea that any of this has become politicized really unworthy of the office that we all hold and unworthy of our republic. So I, I don't blame you, and I probably would have taken the same reaction as you have taken, but very frankly, from the speaker's perspective and from others, uh, this needs to be a commission that does, in fact, commit itself to going where the facts lead and determining the who, what, where, when, and why. Now, I have some very strong feelings as to why the insurrection, or as some say, the tourist visit on your, on, uh, your side of the aisle, Mr. Uh, uh, Whip, uh, the tourist visit that resulted in the death of a number of people terrorizing members of this House who thought their lives were in danger because people were trying to break into the House chamber. The rationalization of that activity has been rampant by many on your side of the aisle. We have some strong feelings on this, and we're going to get to the facts, uh, and the American people will make the ultimate ju judgment, obviously. Uh, and we want to see that commission, again, hoist on your own petard 
The overwhelming majority of you voted against, uh, Mr. Speaker. They voted against uh, a commission, five Republicans appointed by the minority leader, appointed by, not, not recommended by, and five Democrats. Subpoena power shared, and notwithstanding the fact that some of you apparently don't agree, I guarantee you it would have been equal staffing. That would have been resolved. That was not a really big issue. It was a make-up issue to vote no in the United States Senate because, in our view, so you understand, Donald Trump didn't want the commission. And so Donald Trump was saluted. And we didn't get a commission, which was the commission that almost exactly to the jot and tittle, as Mr. Katko said, what the minority leader asked for. So uh, you don't like the result now. I get it. But I believe, as Ms. Cheney said, this is going to be a fact-finding select committee. Witnesses will say what they're going to say. Uh, by the way, one of the people that was uh, rejected by the speaker may well be and may be both uh, uh, witnesses before the uh, select committee. I don't know that. Nobody's told me that, but that may be the case. Uh, so uh, we're going to proceed. I know there's disagreement. I'm, that's not surprising. But you looked the opportunity that you asked for in the eye and rejected it. So here we are. I yield back. Well, first of all, that wasn't the opportunity that we asked for. And I think the majority leader knows that the minority leader put a number of other issues on the table that he wanted to be included in that review, and those were rejected. They were rejected by the speaker. They were rejected by well, the majority. Yield? The majority leader will have an opportunity, but there were a number of things you said, I think, that need to be cleaned up because they're just not accurate. And so if you look at the members that were kicked off from the minority side yesterday, still no explanation given, by the way, that includes a ranking member of a committee and an officer in the United States Navy who was removed yesterday by Speaker Pelosi with no reason given in an unprecedented way. Maybe Speaker Pelosi and maybe this majority don't want to see all the facts come out because they were surely raising, those two members who were removed yesterday were raising very serious questions that ought to be answered. Whatever those answers are, whatever those facts are, they were publicly raising questions. And maybe because they raised those questions that might be uncomfortable for the majority, they were removed from the committee with no explanation given. That had never happened before in the history of this Congress. So again, if you want the facts, don't sit there and say that you want the facts if you're going to remove people who are trying to get facts, who are re raising serious questions that should be answered. They raised them publicly, and they were going to raise them in the committee, and maybe because they were going to raise those tough questions, they were removed by the speaker, members of the minority who were removed by the speaker. I don't know if that's the new precedent that the majority leader wants to see in the future, but I'll tell you, since the gentleman likes quoting Liz Cheney, I will read this quote from Liz Cheney. Quote, Speaker Pelosi and the Democrat majority have no business determining which Republicans sit on committees. That is from Liz Cheney, if the gentleman wants to quote. Is that a quote about Ms. Green? That is a quote about Ms. Green, but uh -huh. it's a general quote about whether or not whoever it is. You can go down your list. By the way, there are members of the majority who were on that committee who voted on January 6th to reject electors. Maybe not this year's January 6th, but as the gentleman knows, every Republican president this century has had Democrats on this House floor object to electors being seated including multiple members of the January 6th committee on the majority side. They weren't removed. In fact, they were appointed by the Speaker. Yet two of our members who raised very serious questions about facts that should be answered, wherever those answers lead, were removed because maybe the majority doesn't want all the facts to come out. Maybe they only want a certain narrative to come out. That's not an investigation. 
That's a kangaroo court if that's the approach that's going to be taken. But the action taken yesterday by the Speaker, the unprecedented action, undermines the credibility of that commission. And it's a shame for the institution because the members we appointed were going there to find the facts, to help participate in finding the facts. And clearly that's not the interest now of this committee that was exposed yesterday in the Speaker's unprecedented action. It's not something that this institution, whether it's Republicans running it or Democrats, and as the gentleman knows, that pendulum swings both ways, but never before this year had a majority removed members that minority leaders submitted for committees. It's just not what's happened in this institution, but now it seems to be the norm because maybe some people that are asking tough questions are asking too tough of questions that this majority doesn't want to be answered. Kind of why this majority won't have a hearing on the origins of COVID. In fact, it was Mr. Jordan who, along with myself and others, has raised serious questions that have been backed up by many medical experts around this country what that COVID-19 very likely started in the Wuhan lab and was leaked out. Medical experts from every walk of life have looked at the genetic makeup of this COVID-19 virus and said it couldn't have been transferred from bats to animals to humans. In fact, it was likely modified genetically in the lab in Wuhan. And yet there is not a single hearing that's been held by this majority on whether it was gain of function research, possibly funded with taxpayer money. All of those questions should be raised, but maybe the majority doesn't want those facts to come out. We should want the facts to come out wherever they lead. So don't pound the desk and say you want the facts when you remove people who are asking questions to get at the facts. Shouldn't be a one-sided question and argument. And I would yield. The legislation we passed said the Speaker would appoint all the members. Uh, these members were not kicked off. They, were never, they never got on. Uh, Liz Cheney was asked whether that was uh, the appropriate thing to do, and her response was, so you, uh, you, you, res you had her quote, I agree with what the Speaker has done. Now, the reason she agreed, uh, yes, they've raised questions. And, and on your side, you wanted to raise questions. You wanted to look at everything but January 6th. Maybe January 6th as well, but you wanted to look at this incident, that incident, the other incident, uh, the incident over here. Are they relevant incidents? Sure they are. But not to January 6th. But why not look at all of them? Not to... I have, I have the time. Gentleman has the time. Uh, the, clearly, when you were in charge, uh, you didn't look at some of the incidents uh, uh, that uh, were, happened while you were in charge uh, that were similar in nature. Very frankly, I think those incidents ought to be looked at, not by this commission, because they were incidents that did not involve insurrection, did not involve stopping the work of the Congress of the United States, did not terrorize members of this House. Now, I know that some of you have had pictures taken of you in this house. You look pretty terrified to me. You thought there was something serious happening. And this stuff that this was a tourist visit is absurd. And the issue of dissembling is not new. President Trump put that in an art form. If he didn't like what was going on here, he created something over here with a tweet or a comment or an action that he took. That's the shell game. The issue is what happened on January 6th? What was the insurrection about? What were people coming into the Capitol saying, let's hang the vice president of the United States? Not of our party. You know, people shake their heads. I'm not sure why they're shaking their heads. They saw it on television. They see it on the tapes over and over and over. They see people being convicted. I happen to think the sentences are too short. It was treason. It was treason based upon a lie. And we need to get to the bottom of it. And what the speaker has done is made sure that we're going to get to the bottom of it, notwithstanding the fact, and I will repeat again, all of you had the opportunity to vote Five, five, shared the subpoena 
looked at the, and the speaker and the leader was empowered to appoint anybody he want. The legislation that passed this House said the speaker would appoint. The speaker. Did she consult with the minority leader? She did. And did she disagree with two that he appointed? She did. And she did not appoint them. That was in her power. And I agree with her. And Liz Cheney agreed with her. Why? Because that would have been dissembling, not looking for facts. Mr. Jordan has said over and over again, he believes the election was stolen. Court after court after court after court said no proof. No proof. And so we are where we are. And we're going to proceed. And we're going to proceed. And if, if the Speaker decides to withhold the three and name two others, so be it. We're going to proceed. We're going to proceed and we're going to get the facts. And we're going to get those facts known to the American people. It's going to be widely covered. There are going to be a lot of witnesses. And we're going to find out the who. Maybe that's the problem. The who. And the what. And the where. And the why. For the first time in history, Americans, Trump signs waving, stopped the business of the Congress of the United States. An insurrection. And from my view, a treasonous act. So we're going to proceed. I yield back. And again, if the facts were what the majority wants, then the majority wouldn't be afraid of certain members asking tough questions that maybe the majority doesn't want. And since the gentleman brought up Mr. Jordan, I'll tell you a question that Mr. Jordan's been raising publicly. One of the questions Mr. Jordan's been raising is why weren't the Capitol Police better equipped when there was intelligence prior, weeks prior to January 6th, that there may be large crowds, there may be threats. Why weren't the Capitol Police more equipped? Were National Guard offered to the Capitol that were rejected? And at what level, if that's the case, were they rejected? Maybe he was starting to ask those questions. Maybe he should have just sat back and not raised those questions until after the committee started, but he started raising those questions. And by the way, they're important questions to be answered, but he won't be able to ask those questions about why the Capitol Police weren't better equipped because Speaker Pelosi yanked him off the committee when he was selected by the minority leader. And you could talk about the power of the Speaker and brag that that's our power. But just because you have the might doesn't make it right. What she did was an abuse to say, I'm just going to choose who on the Republican side I'm going to allow. But boy, if some other members are going to ask tough questions, I have the power to take them off. That's not what power is used for. <laughs> this House, this democracy, we should want the facts. And if some members are going to ask tough questions, you should want everybody to be asking tough questions. And if the facts lead there, you go there. If the facts don't lead there, you go somewhere else and you ask more tough questions. Well, but if some members are going to ask tough questions that the majority doesn't want to be asked, well, the that undermines yield. the credibility of that commission to remove them from asking those questions. And I would yield. Does the gentleman believe that the three members that the speaker accepted and uh, was willing to appoint would not have asked those questions? I yield. They haven't said publicly whether they would or not. Mr. Jordan sure did. And, and again, maybe he was punished for raising tough questions in advance of the hearing and should have waited. But in the end, those were questions. Sheriff Nels, who was also one of our selections, he was right there with these brave Capitol Police officers holding down the House of Representatives so the chamber wasn't breached. Sheriff Nels was right there. But again, if the integrity of that commission is now undermined because Speaker Pelosi chose no, no, to don't. remove people who were going to ask tougher questions, then ultimately it proves that this is not a commission set on finding the facts. It's a commission set on establishing a narrative. 
regardless of the facts. That's a disgrace for this institution to go down that road. There's still time to reconsider. I would urge the majority to reconsider how they use or abuse the power that's vested upon them. And I would yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Your side had, a, had an opportunity to support the Capitol Police. Your side had an opportunity to support law enforcement. Your, your side had the opportunity to increase the capability of the Capitol Police to respond uh, to insurrectionist, violent, criminal uh, agents. Your side had that opportunity, and what did it do to a person? Voted no. And we passed it. We passed support of the Capitol Police. We passed support to strengthen our defenses. We passed uh, legislation to try to make the Capitol more secure and our Capitol Police safer. We passed that legislation, now with a single one of your votes. And it went to the Senate. And it sits. And you read what that's doing to the morale of the Capitol Police and some of your comments about the Capitol Police. So you had that opportunity, uh, I'd say to the Speaker, the Republicans had that opportunity. And just as they rejected the five and five, they rejected support of the Capitol Police. And 17 of them voted against giving them a gold medal. Why? Because the insurrection was mentioned in the resolution. And of course, there was no insurrection. It was a tourist visit as they ambled politely through the halls of the Congress, saying how appreciative they were of the efforts being made by their Democratic representatives. If you saw it that way, if you believe that, it is impossible for me to understand why. So uh, I tell the whip, Mr. Speaker, that the Republican Party has had two opportunities to have an even, fair commission. They rejected, apparently, according to what the whip says, because we didn't want to look at Seattle. Uh, we didn't want to look at this city or that city or the other city or this, that, the other. And by the way, Vice President Biden made it very clear that uh, those who committed criminal activities were not demonstrators, they were criminals. Biden said that. And I agree with him. What they didn't want to look at is who recruited the crowd that came in here? Who riled that crowd up? And who deployed them to the capital of the United States for the specific objective of stopping the steal? And what he meant, of course, is us acting. And his vice president, who he talked to on numerous occasions about stopping the election, concluded that that was not legal, that was not within his authority. And so he acted consistent with the law. That really annoyed Mr. Trump. So here we are. We should have had a bipartisan commission. We should have moved that forward. And yes, we should support the Capitol Police by adopting a supplemental and by the way, the Senate supplemental is more in terms of dollars than the House supplemental. So it's not a question of the, we spent too much money to do this, to make the Capitol safe, to make the Capitol police uh, uh, armed, to give them uh, opportunity to get intelligence that they need to uh, conceive. But what a distraction that the Capitol police weren't prepared. <clears throat> The question is not were they, were they prepared. The question is, why did American citizens try to commit insurrection and treason in the capital of the United States and stopped our work? 
not for very long. We came back, we did our work, and we got it done to the benefit of our country and our democracy and our image around the world. Our democracy was resilient. And nobody was angrier, I will tell you, and I think, Mr. Scalise, you were there, uh, Mr. Speaker, nobody was angrier at what was happening that night than Mitch McConnell, the leader of the Senate, who said he believed, uh, subsequent to his voting against impeachment, that notwithstanding that, he believed the president bore responsibility. As the minority leader said, not all responsibility, but bore responsibility. So we're going to look at this. You can talk all you want. Your, your leader has now decided he's going to withdraw the three and not participate. We regret that. But it's not going to stop us. It's not going to stop us getting at the truth. It's not going to stop us at having the American people know the who, what, where, and when, and why of the first time since 1812 when a foreign power invaded our capital, that the capital of the United States was invaded by people who were seeking to undermine the democratic processes under our Constitution. And I yield back. Well, thank the gentleman for yielding. And it's unfortunate that as that commission starts, it will not include other members, Republican members, who wanted to ask some of those tough questions in terms of supporting the police. Well, has a Republican I don't think the gentleman, I don't think the gentleman has seen any stronger support for police than on this side of the aisle. I've been maybe more vocal than anyone about support for the United States Capitol Police because I wouldn't be here alive today without the bravery and heroism of the Capitol Police. And I think we all stand with them. And ultimately, when you look at the supplemental, when it came through the House in May, there were a number of members on the Democrat majority side who voted against that supplemental who have been vocal about defunding the police. And in fact, we've been trying to bring up HRS 352, which expresses support for police in opposition to this crazy radical idea of defunding the police, where many of these cities that have actually defunded police <laughs> are seeing rapid increases in crime. And even more, and I know I've held roundtables with sheriffs from the New Orleans area, as many uh, of my colleagues have met with law enforcement, they'll tell you the biggest challenge today, in addition to the growing crime wave they're seeing, is a demoralization around the country for police because they see these efforts to defund the police and they see elected officials speaking out publicly against police. And it's not coming from the Republican side. I think the gentleman knows where it's coming from. But why won't this bill be brought to the floor to just express support for police? Uh, the fact that the majority on the Democrat side will not bring a resolution to express support for police, HRES 352, by Ms. Meliotakis and others, at a time when we are seeing around the country not only a demoralization, but an increase in resignations, people leaving the great work of law enforcement because they see in those communities that have defunded the police a lack of support. Most sheriffs will tell you they're having trouble recruiting new people right now because of the attacks on police uh, all around the country that we saw from the summer through, where cops were murdered, shot, beaten, and yet a resolution to express support to let them know that we have their back still won't be brought to the floor by this majority. I hope the gentleman would look at bringing HRES 352 to the floor so that we can actually express to all police that we support them and that we do have their back. And I would yield on that. I thank the gentleman for yielding. You had an opportunity to support the police, and you voted with those who wanted to fund the police. All of you. You had an opportunity just a few weeks ago where we had a bill on the floor to support and to fund the Capitol Police to make them safer, more effective, uh, and better uh, able to enforce the law. And you all, to a person, voted no. You had the opportunity. So, uh, and you voted with those who you say on our aisle didn't want to do that. Uh, but 
It passed. Why did it pass? Because the overwhelming, overwhelming, overwhelming majority of Democrats, it's the only reason it passed, voted to support the police, our Capitol Police. And I will tell you, that is also true of our members in terms of supporting uh, law enforcement at the federal, state, and local levels. Are there some who say some things? Uh, yes, there are some, some people who say some things on your side. I've, I've quoted a couple of them uh, that uh, uh, I'm sure you don't support. Uh, but having said that, you know, the proof is in the eating of the pudding. We had a bill on the floor that supported the police. You voted against it. Every one of you. Mr. Speaker, uh, you can talk all you want about supporting them. Uh, but very frankly, uh, the bills you're going to be voting on next week support the police. They're not defunding. Unlike the Trump budgets, if you look at the Trump budgets, who cut law enforcement funding? Trump budgets. Check me on that. Then come to the floor and say Hoyer was not, tr not telling the truth. Check me. You had an opportunity, uh, Mr. Speaker. The minority had an opportunity to support the police. They all voted no. The Senate's doing the same. Um, it's a shame because it's undermining the morale of the Capitol Police. And you've seen that reported in the newspapers. This is not me saying it. They don't understand why. Uh, and, and Mr. Scalise uh, is absolutely right. Uh, the Capitol Police have kept him in particular and others who were uh, attacked by a crazed, uh, apparently left wing, but a crazed, bad person. Maybe, maybe mentally defective, but did a very bad act, and he was a targeting Republicans. And we all stood up and uh, when Mr. Scalise was in the hospital and thanked the Capitol Police for protecting him and others on that site. That was a terrible, terrible, venal, criminal act. The guy was probably a Democrat. I don't know. And we'll call him out for being that. Uh, and that's what we all, all do. And on January 6th, some very bad criminal people acted in this Congress, in this Capitol, against our democracy, against our Constitution. And we want to study it. We want to get the facts so it doesn't happen again. And so we know who is fomenting this insurrectionist psychology. Who rationalizes it on this floor? Now. I yield. Thank the gentleman for yielding. And just to point out, President Biden himself a year ago said he supports efforts to divert money away from police, which, by the way, is the same thing as defunding police. If you're diverting money say? away from police, you're defunding police. But again, there's a resolution uh, that's been sitting out there for a while now to 352. express support. I hope we would bring that the number. to the floor and express that support. There are also a number of other issues uh, dealing with inflation. We're seeing a dramatic increase in inflation across this country. Uh, everything somebody buys from going to a grocery store, we're paying more uh, for things like eggs and milk. If you try to go on a summer vacation right now, you're paying over 40% more for gasoline. Uh, you're seeing it across the board. And that increase in inflation, dramatic increase, is a tax. It's a tax on hardworking families. This shows, for the gentleman, so many of those things. Used cars up 45 percent. If you can even find a car to buy because there's such a shortage when the government's paying people not to work. The borrowing, by the way, and spending of trillions of dollars, which is some of the items that are going to be coming to the floor next week and beyond, trillions more much of it deficit spending is part of the reason we're seeing inflation in those things. Gas, 45% up. Home prices, 15% up. Milk, 5%. Laundry machines, 
29% if you can get one. You might have to wait six months to get a washer and dryer. Uh, all of this is a tax on hardworking middle class families. Uh, what we should be doing is bringing legislation to the floor to confront these problems, not to keep spending trillions and trillions more in deficit spending and higher taxes that ultimately would lead to a more evaporation of middle class jobs, uh, which is what the majority is bringing. But I would hope uh, that the gentleman would look at legislation working with Republicans to start addressing some of these problems that are affecting household families all across this country. Republican, Democrat, Independent, doesn't matter. They're seeing this problem. And they would like to see this Congress confront it, not make it worse with more deficit spending, with more multi-trillion dollar spending bills uh, and higher taxes that will ship more jobs overseas, shutting down energy production in America while the President's signing or authorizing uh, agreements with Russia to use pipelines to ship their energy to other countries. He's shutting down pipelines in America so that we can use more of our natural resources, again, leading to higher prices across the board, things that are adversely affecting families. I would hope we could bring legislation to confront these challenges to the floor, and I would yield. I thank the gentleman uh, for yielding. Uh, we, we have brought them to the floor. We're going to continue to bring them to the floor, and we hope you support them. Uh, we've created three million new jobs, more jobs in our first five months than any administration in history. You forgot to mention that figure. Uh, at double the monthly rates of the five months prior to that under the Trump administration. The average number of new unemployment insurance claims has been cut in half. Last week, that number was about 400,000. The same week last year, it was 1.5 million under the Trump administration. Small business optimism has returned to its 2019 average. The economy grew at 6.4% in the first quarter. Independent projections from CBO, the IMF, the Federal Reserve, the World Bank, and OECD, and many others all forecast America this year reaching the highest level of growth in nearly four decades. Uh, furthermore, as you know, uh, the director of the Federal Reserve has opined that he thinks, yes, there is a surge. Uh, in inflation. Yes, we're concerned about it. The Federal Reserve is watching it. We are watching it. Uh, we want to keep inflation in check. The gentleman referenced that we're paying people not to work. Let me remind the gentleman we had four bills which did similar things that were passed in overwhelming bipartisan fashion last year. Overwhelming bipartisan fashion. Uh, and None of them would have become law without the signature of President Donald Trump. Now, what happened? Donald Trump left, and bipartisanship left with him. Not because he was so bipartisan, but he thought that doing what we were doing was good for the people, and therefore, I think he thought good politics. Uh, I think that's accurate. The fact is that uh, uh, this economy is now doing exactly what we want it to do. It's growing. Now, it's surged. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And that surge uh, has resulted in inflation uh, hiking at a higher rate than we would like, uh, including the products that the uh, whip uh, mentioned, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we need to contain inflation because it does rob those, particularly on fixed incomes. Uh, but uh, the multi-trillions that were spent last year, uh, one of which, the CARES Act, was spent with almost a unanimous vote in, in this House, $2 trillion. So uh, we did that because we believed that the magnitude of the challenge confronting us by COVID-19, both to the health of our people and the health of our economy, demanded such a robust response. Uh, one of our members who had been vaccinated, some members hadn't been vaccinated, uh, has come down. Now, ho hopefully the vaccinations that he has will moderate any adverse impact of this Delta virus. But I would say to the gentleman, uh, 
it's a little bit like uh, the, uh, the commission. You want to focus on the bad news, not focus on the good news. You want to focus on other news, not the central news of the insurrection. Um, and I understand that strategy, but there's a lot of good news happening in America. There's some bad news, too. Part of it is because people haven't gotten vaccinated. Your state has that problem. Mississippi has that problem. South Carolina has some other states have that problem. Uh, my state has that problem. Not to the extent of some other states, but all 50 states are seeing a surge. So that giving up and getting off the field at this point in time is not appropriate. And I think that we're going to find that the president's program that he suggests, as he says, and I agree, will have a generational impact for decades to come in making sure that our economy continues to grow, that our people are educated, that we expand the middle class, uh, lift people out of poverty, uh, as we did with uh, ch children, uh, who are now 50% of them are going to be lifted out of poverty. That's good news for America. It's good news for all of us. Those kids are going to be better educated and make more productive con contributions to our society. So uh, I, I, don't, I hope a number of you will support pieces of legislation. We'll, we'll carry that uh, vision of the president's into fruition. Uh, and we'll, we'll work towards that end. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. And as we look at those bills that are coming to the floor next week, frankly, they would make those problems worse. And uh, I know when we talk about the inflation side, uh, we talk about inflation because it's the thing we hear the most when we talk to our constituents back home. Because regardless of the statistics, the data is little solace if you see your dollar going for less further, less far. Uh, in fact, you see your dollar not going as far because whatever you're making, you're spending even more money than you were spending before and waiting longer to get things uh, because of these policies. In fact, the spending itself is part of the problem that is leading to inflation. People get that. <laughs> and so they look at these multi-trillion dollar spending bills and they're starting to ask the questions, what's really in those bills? If it's not things to help my family, because I'm paying more with all this new spending, what is in it? We just found out today there's millions of dollars in the bill that's coming to the floor next week, specifically just for one entity, Planned Parenthood of Marmont, San Jose, California. Planned Parenthood, the largest provider of abortions in the country. So not only is Hyde being discarded, the mutually agreed upon, bipartisan, and not just Henry Hyde with a few other people. Henry Hyde passed this in the 1970s under a Democrat majority. Democrats and Republicans said taxpayer funding shouldn't be used to provide abortion, and it had always been sacrosanct in spending bills that this Congress passed, Republican and Democrat, since that time until now. And so not only are they gutting Hyde in the bill, but they're putting millions of dollars into Planned Parenthood by name. This is what drives people nuts when they see that kind of spending and a disconnect because they're paying more money for regular household goods, and instead of us confronting that on the floor, they see this kind of spending that is generational because it's the next generation that will have to pay for it. Because as much as it seems this majority wants to raise taxes to spend more money, even all the taxes that would run more jobs out of this country don't cover all of this kind of radical spending. Uh, I would hope we go a different direction. We surely will be opposing that kind of radical spending, uh, and it surely won't be helping those families who just want answers, who just want to see relief from the problems that they're facing. And I would yield. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, it was not radical spending in 2020 because Trump signed the bills. Trump left and it became radical spending. That's situational ethics, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Final point I'd like to, to bring up is
to the leader, we are seeing something that actually is very encouraging in Cuba, and that is the people of Cuba taken to the streets to demand freedom, something that's been decades in the making. I would hope that we see all government leaders, Republican, Democrat, executive branch, legislative branch, all expressing our support for the Cuban people who seek freedom. Because I think one of the most heartfelt signs that I know I saw and so many of my colleagues saw just a week ago were not only people taken to the streets to a call for freedom, they were carrying the American flag in Cuba, and we see this all around the world. It's, it's one of the things that, for all of our differences, brings us together, and that is that here in this United States Congress, we're not only working to promote freedom in this country and to preserve it for future generations, but this freedom that we work to preserve inspires people all around the world. And whether it's Cuba or in Iran, which we saw years ago, or any other country, when people seek freedom, there's really only one flag that they wave, and that's the United States flag. And uh, our colleague, Mario Diaz-Ballard, whose family fled Cuba, uh, like so many of our colleagues, uh, some first generation, Carlos, uh, Carlos Jimenez, a former mayor of Miami-Dade, personally fled uh, Cuba seeking freedom and talk about the American dream. A first generation who fled a socialist nation who is now a sitting voting member of the United States Congress who now wants to express support for the Cuban people. And so there's a resolution, HRS 527, that expresses our solidarity standing with the people in Cuba who are seeking freedom. Uh, I would just ask the gentleman if he would look at bringing that bill to the floor. Uh, so as the people in Cuba are trying to get that freedom and they're being heavily oppressed, many may even be, be being murdered right now as, as they've shut down the internet, they've shut out the media because there is no freedom of the press. We are hearing stories that are, that are very alarming. Uh, if we can express our support that we're standing with those people in Cuba who do seek freedom as well. I think it would be a very strong signal, and I would ask the gentleman if we could look at bringing thank, that to the floor, and I would yield. I thank the gentleman for his comments. As he knows, the President of the United States has strongly expressed support of those who are seeking freedom and liberty uh, in Cuba. Uh, he said that uh, shortly after the demonstrations occurred. He has maintained that position. I share that opinion with him. And uh, uh, we are discussing uh, what action we might be taking here in this House. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and I appreciate that. Hopefully we can work together to get, uh, to get that brought to the floor and express that support in, in unison, and that would send a strong message. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time.